Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Alderman Meeting Reports for the November 23rd, 2021 City Council Meeting in Branson. Kind of a quick meeting, you know, and uh, to be honest, the Aldermen, they, they deserve that. They've been sitting there going for four or five hours, you know, handling a lot of really important issues. So it's nice every once in a while to just have some kind of some contractual things to deal with and, and not have to wait um, so long, you know, to, to be home with their families and everything like that. So, you know, and also it's, it's important because the later the meetings go, it's not just about, um, kind of commitment, which is a, a big commitment, um, to be a, on the board of aldermen, but also when they start getting into the fourth hour and the fifth hour, um, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, you know, I, I can notice, and, and I've even heard this from some of the people on the board is that, you know, they don't start diving into the issues as much as they can. You know, you, you start kind of just wanting to move things along more. And each and every issue deserves the proper time that it takes, you know. So um, they, they've been kicking around some different ideas. Maybe at 10 o'clock, should they cut it off? That'd be a four-hour meeting. Or should it have a vote to cut it off? Um, I think what can happen actually is we can rewire the way that our um, agendas are set up. And that, that takes the city administrator doing that and working with the mayor. And so um, as we get past the next election and kind of see what the new makeup of our board is, perhaps we can do a little bit of a better job of, of kind of setting the agenda for the meetings and, and moving forward that way. So because of that, um, and this happened at the last meeting, Mayor Milton, he's asked that the people that come and speak only speak on items that are pertinent to Branson and that the Board of Aldermen can directly deal with. So there was another individual who he speaks um, every time, talks about kind of um, COVID and things like that. Um, and, and, you know, Larry let him speak. And then he said, I didn't want to cut you off, but I wanted to um, just ask, you know, so, sort of what can we do about this? Um, so I appreciate that, that Larry is, is being kind of steadfast on that. Um, you know, he ran on the, the idea of, of transparency and, and letting the, the citizens speak. But, you know, it is true. Our, our time is valuable and, and they need to speak. But and people have done some some interesting things in the past. They've gone out there and read poems and this and that. And so, um, you know, I sort of agree that the, the items that that need to be discussed at the Alderman meeting need to ha be pertinent to Branson. So, of course, we keep dealing with this issue with the uh, the project next to Country Bluff Estates. Um, the representative from the neighborhood got up again and spoke and. She talked about the MHDC meeting, which is a essentially a meeting to give funding to certain low-income housing um, developments in this community. She quoted Alderman Skeins, who was on the phone call for the meeting, saying that the city needs about 800 to 900 low-income housing projects. This was his quote, and we'll do almost anything to get them. You know, I'm going to continue to return to this point in my further reports. But you know, this is something that almost uh, has become one of those talking points in Branson about the low income housing. I, I think it's important that people are housed and that folks don't have to live in long term extended stay hotels because there are a myriad of problems that come with that. Not just it, from a compassionate standpoint um, for those people, because now they've made a ruling where you can't have a hot plate in those rooms because of fire codes and this and that, but also just for the, the health and safety of the Branson community as a whole. You know, those ex kind of extended stay hotels are just, uh, I guess you could say laboratories for drug use and, and, and crime and all things like that. So, you know, I think we need to be careful when we talk about, you know, the, the low-income housing projects because, you know, just like the, the drug rehabilitation facilities in this community, um, kind of were acted as a magnet to our town. It's the same thing. The more you build it, the more they come kind of thing. Um, so I think we need we need housing uh, that that can benefit all individuals at all levels in our community. Um, but let's not just sort of sort of go in that direction solely. And I'm gonna have some more updates on this um, as we go forward in the future. So the representative of Country Bluff Estates keeps asking, why was zoning on the Planning and Zoning Commission bypassed when they zoned the project next to Country Bluff Estates? The board has, has offered her the answer that, and we went over this last time, that essentially they're concerned that they'll either be sued by the Neighborhood Homeless Housing Association or they'll be sued by the developer. 
if Miss Webster is correct, I don't know what grounds the developer would have to sue on. But because of this, and because of the litigious society that we live in today, I've always been very careful, and I and I feel that she has as well. I don't I don't speak for her. I've always not being defamatory in the language. You know, talking about the track record of the development as opposed to um, you know character of the developer, anything like that. Um, I happen to know the developer. Um, happen to have you know somewhat of a, a relationship with him in the past. But you know, um, uh, Alderman Skeins always sort of calls him out, so to speak. I, I think he's trying to help him. Um, in these meetings, but he always says, you know, would you like to come up and speak, sir? You know, to kind of, and you know, oftentimes it's strategic not to speak when, when you don't want to speak about something, you know, and uh, he hollered out in the meeting, you know, he said, you, you can't get into a peeing contest with a snake in the grass. And he used a little bit more animated language than I cleaned it up for you guys. But you know, it's just, it's just uncalled for. Now he was called out on the spot and everything, but you know, we don't have to get into negative ad hominem attacks. I, I just feel that's, that's unnecessary and kind of, lends to the whole thing of, of why there's been frustration in the first place, I feel like, you know. Um, but, you know, Ms. Webster also did quote Attorney LeBeck that said there's no legal requirement to go through p and I mean, folks, she's laid out the case. It seems to me that there is. Um, and so, you know, it'd be interesting to see how this, this progresses. But I'm really proud of our mayor because Mayor Milton called for an agenda item to vote on this. Um, you know, that, that I think will reveal a lot, not only about the courage of him to, to go forward with that, because, you know, the other aldermen, they, you know, it's, it's, it's a common thing. If a vote is going to be hard to take, just don't take the vote, right? That's easier than putting your name on the record for something. And so sometimes it's good to, to kind of call them out, call the question has been said, you know, um, and make people vote on something and make them go on the record. So I think that's really important, and that's going to be on an agenda um, for an upcoming session. So I'm going to move on to a, just a couple more issues that we have here, and then I'm going to read one of my articles from the Branson Statesman um, because we did have a, a short agenda on the meeting. Uh, Mayor Milton wanted them to kind of trim some of the code um, because some of it has gotten a little um, out of whack uh, on uh, just the length of things, you know, the redundancy. And so we had some, some trimming of some redundancy um, by Joel Hornick, our planning director outgoing planning director. And then finally, I want to give a, a small update on the Ozark Mountain Christmas effort that we've been going, uh, initiated. We, you know, it's really exciting. We've really gotten this off the ground and it's been really great. We started a, a Facebook group over a month ago and it's already over 1,500 members. Really, really proud of that. It's, it's bigger than the other Christmas groups in this town, which is really awesome was my goal. Um, and, and so we've got these decals in. We're going to be going from business to business. That'll be my job, actually making sure people are putting them on. But you know, even one of the aldermen um, who sort of wasn't one of our original coalition um, that kind of helped us with this said, wow, you guys have done an absolutely great job. He actually he said, I, I thank you, Marshall. You've done a great job about uh, getting the word out there. He said, I've heard Ozark Mountain Christmas said more and more than ever before. You know, so really excited about that. Um, and then, of course, I'm going to wrap up here with the third article on the Branson Statesman. Um, as you guys know, Forsyth Headline News, who helps us kind of produce um, these, these live reports, um, is one of our primary sponsors on the, Ozark, on the uh, Branson Statesman. Um, and so I'm going to deliver this one that is yet to be uh, released to the public, um, but I think it's important. And, and it goes towards uh, one of the issues that I constantly fight for and some of the things we talked about um, in our report here. So, title crime. Quote, Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Dr. Martin Luther King. The world is changing. We all understand that and don't expect everywhere to be Mayberry for the rest of our lives. However, Branson has been different and set apart from the rest of the country always. Crime has gone in waves in this culture over the generations. And some of the excesses of the 1970s that haunted major cities like New York seem to be reemerging. The cocaine epidemic of a previous era has given way to an opioid crisis of today. And while drugs can be a major cause of crime, it isn't the only factor by any means. So let's focus on Branson specifically. There has been quite a bit of discussion in our community over the past few years on what some have called magnets. That term is meant to speak about a dynamic that is created by the prevalence of drug rehabilitation facilities in our town 
and how they attract participants from the surrounding Ozarks. And even the most successful of these programs, they still have a rate of, of sobriety of only about a quarter of their participants. Therefore, people come to our community to participate in these programs, then fail out, but remain in the town. They also find a natural home in the extended stay hotels around Branson. Compassion has always been a bedrock of who we are, but protecting our families comes first. Furthermore, we are simply not a big enough city to have the infrastructure to care for an influx of citizens who need this kind of care that we simply cannot provide. So having said all of that, substantial examples of crime are needed to fully illustrate the point. Last year, Branson's Parks Department created a temporary program called the 20 and 20 Challenge, where they encouraged citizens to hike 20 miles of our tra trails in the year 2020. Being an avid outdoorsman myself, I participated in this challenge at the first opportunity I had. After I finished the few hikes it took to reach that many miles logged and promoted this venture on my social media sites, a number of car break-ins started occurring at the very sites and parking lots adjacent to our trails. Needless to say, I felt a natural guilt about leading the lambs to slaughter, so to speak. This wasn't the first time we had break-ins at cars within the proximity, but opportunist criminals seemed to take advantage of the increased activity. I began, I began to share my concerns with the public during my last campaign and got pushback from a small minority saying that I was only uh, using this as a political issue. I find that assertion to be an absurd claim. Within the past year or so, in my neighborhood behind Dolly Stampede, there has been a murder that took place that took the lives of two people, a home invasion, property damage from a vehicle being driven into the side of an apartment complex, and those break-ins at the trail right across the street. To say that this activity is not genuinely concerning to me in my neighborhood is highly disingenuous. The real question is what we do about it. I think you must begin addressing those magnets that were discussed above. Another aspect of this fight is to ensure our police have the proper resources to handle the problem. We are often given crime statistics that I feel can be misleading, and that can affect how the citizens view this issue. If you have two murders one year and one murder the next, that is a degree decrease in the murder rate of 50%. When the reality is, a community like Branson shouldn't have any murders at all. Too frequently, we have reports at City Hall that highlight the rosy picture as opposed to the underlying reality. Our police are short-staffed, and that is an ongoing issue. But that doesn't mean that we can't place more emphasis on areas such as robbery and violent crime within our tourism districts that have been afterthoughts in the past. We cannot stop the world from turning, but we can be vigilant. To say that Branson doesn't have growing crime challenges makes that messenger part of the problem. We shouldn't point fingers, but we should hold our elected officials accountable to keeping us safe. Safety is a state of mind, and we need to return to the peace of mind that the citizens of Branson once cherished. Thank you, and I'll be signing off today. Bye-bye.